our school drama fit. And every day we're proud to say the name of our school drama fit. Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Moffitt Cowtail Podcast 2021. I'm Isabella. And I'm David. We have a fantastic guest who has been instrumental in helping Moffitt build up our makerspace. Learn about the science of energy and green energy. Our guest today is Miss Emily Hawk. Paul Baker, who works as a project manager for the Need Two project. The Need Two. Hello, Miss Paul Baker. Thank you for being a part of the Moffitt Hotel 2021. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. Can you tell our guest a little about the Need Project? Sure. The Need Project stands for the National Energy Education Development Project, and we have been around for 40 years um, doing energy education in schools. It started in the state of Virginia back when this guy, Jimmy Carter, was president a long time ago, and we've been working ever since across the country and sometimes internationally to help bring energy education activities to teachers like Mr. Ralph. Mr. Jamino here at uh, Moffitt, and uh, students across the country. So we work with students from everywhere from Massachusetts to New Mexico and everywhere in between. Um, we have programs, we have after school activities, we have classroom materials, and we make those things available so that you all can use them, learn from them, and take what you've learned home and to your families. What exactly does your job entail and how does it relate to Pico P, Pico Energizing Education Program? Sure. So I am the curriculum director. I basically create all of the materials that students will inter students and their teachers will interact with when they're learning about energy. I used to be an eighth grade science teacher in Delaware County and I used these materials when I was teaching and I wanted to help work with them and make them better and that's what I do today. Um, and the PICO uh, or PEEP program, as you guys know it, helps to use those materials to teach about energy sources, about energy transformations, about how we get our electricity, and how we can save energy. So all of those materials are things that I write and work with and edit and make better and more fun. So I come up with all of the hands-on materials that you get to play with, and then we help teachers in the area turn them into projects like you all have created apps, podcasts, um, they build models, and they learn how to um, think about energy in the world around them and how people can make the world around them a better place. Very detailed. <clears throat> what do you choose to work with Pico Peep? Um, what was the question? Oh, Why did you choose to work with Pico Peep? Sure. So I started working with Pico Peep as a teacher. I was a, I was only in my second year as a teacher and I had kids who needed a challenge. They needed something to work on and my curriculum was new. The, the principal told me I had to teach about energy and it was something that I wasn't familiar with. And so I found this program and we, started using it in our in our classroom teaching about energy and my kids loved it i had some students that didn't really pay attention much um and science wasn't their thing and they started to pay attention more and they started to play along and enjoy the hands-on activities that we did and i haven't stopped working with pico peep ever since we understand that you are a science teacher do you have to study any spring, anything specific in college or university for your career? What attracted yeah. you to that branch of science? Sure. So I went to school to to study earth science, and I studied 
um, geoscience most of the time, and climate and geography. So a little bit about weather, a little bit about maps, and uh, GIS, which is a technology that we use to, to map our, our world. And I studied a lot about rocks. And I energy was a part of everything I did in all of those activities and my internships, but working with people wasn't always a part of it. And I missed, you know, working with students, I missed working with other people. So I also took some education classes and became a teacher as well. We participated in the Energy Innovation Challenge a few years ago as third graders. It was a great experience. Can you set some criteria that students need to follow to win? Sure, sure. Um, and winners you were. You all, you all put together quite a great project, I have to say. Congratulations. Uh, students who work in the Pico Peep program and work on the challenge like you did um, have to do a few things. They have to learn about energy throughout their science classes, and they have to play with some hands-on activities, and try to find a way to teach others about energy in some way. And we tell them they can do that in any way they want, as long as they find something new or different that they haven't done already with the activities. And so in some cases, it's developing technology or a video game or an app. And in some cases, it's designing a, a new building to to support solar panels and things like that. So the Pico Peep students who participate can do a wide range of, of activities and their challenges can look a lot different as long as they're exploring energy and trying to find a way to teach others about what they've learned. Who, if anyone, eh, who, if anyone, I inspired you to help the energy conservation and or STEM? So when I was a student your age, um, there weren't a lot of females that I saw learning about science. And science wasn't always my favorite subject, but I learned about when I was in second grade, we were watching the news in class and there was an astronaut, her name was Mae Jameson, and she was one of the first female, black female astronauts um, to ever go into space. And that was really inspiring to me because I hadn't seen a lot of girls doing things like that on the news. And I thought that was pretty fun. Another person that I really started to become inspired by when I was studying earth science and, and energy conservation, and uh, <laughs> it, she lived a little while earlier than Mae Jameson, um, was Rachel Carson. And she was an author. She's famous for um, The Silent Spring, which was about thinking about pesticides and thinking about how we interact with our world around us and um, positive and negative impacts of, of things in our world. And I would say the last person that I think is super inspiring and I love, because I also love things that aren't science related, um, is Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I love watching him because he makes science fun for people. And one of the things he does that I like is he takes movies that we think are interesting and fun, like um, maybe Captain America or Armageddon, an older movie, and he tells you about the science that's real and the science that's fake. And I think that's the you also authored a book entitled Energy Lab for Kids, 40 Exciting Experiments to Explore, Create Hardness and Unleash Energy. Tell us about that experience. Sure. Um, writing a, a book is a little bit different. It's something that I had never done before. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of communication. So here I was writing all of the materials myself, but I always had to, just like... Mr. Domino probably puts comments on your papers and says, can you fix this? It was a lot of fixing my work. It was a lot of red pen that I wasn't used to seeing, <laughs> um, colored ink on the page from my editor. But it was fun to kind of think about things in a different way um, with using a lot of color and a lot of pictures and, and trying to make science accessible to everybody so that you could take it at home when you're not having school and still do some fun science at the same time. It was definitely a lot of work. How did you gather the experiments and go about getting it published? So we were, I was actually approached by someone 
who uh, at the publishing company and that that series of books is a, a series that you could find lots of different titles um, of, that are pretty similar like art experiments and kitchen activities and growing plants and they didn't have anything in the energy world so they came to, to me and asked if I would be interested and I kind of created a lot of the activities based on things that I had worked with and knew students like you had enjoyed. So I put it, I put a lot of the more fun things that kids like to do in the book. Do you have a say in who wins the Pico Invitation Challenges? I don't have a say. Uh, we try to pick judges so that I don't have to pick. I think if I were to have to pick, it would be too challenging because I really love seeing all the work that the students do. And I really love working with their teachers all year long. And I, I, I carefully pick a bunch of unbiased judges who've never met you before so that they can do the picking. Um, and usually it all, it works out the way it should anyway. And they pick the people that I think were the most de um, deserving in the long run, so. And how are tie scores handled? Oof. So we've actually had a situation where we had the judges behind the scenes arguing over a winner and they were tied. So we had to have, and none of you all knew this, but we had to have a secret judge for a tiebreaker. And this was a volunteer at the Franklin Institute who kind of walked around the, the activities and he looked like he was just kind of like a security guard that day, making sure everybody was doing what they were supposed to do. But he was secretly a judge listening into all the conversations and he helped us break the tie. Have you been influenced by one of the invitation projects yourself? If so, how is the invitation helping the environment? I've been really, really influenced a lot by, by your projects. Um, the students in this program have taught me that learning looks different for everybody. And what I used to teach in the classroom isn't necessarily the way that kids all like to learn now. And so seeing all of the cool technologies and ways that kids like students at Moffitt took a video game and made it super informative, um, things like that taught me that innovation can look a lot of different ways. And so I've been really inspired by you and all of the hard work that you do. Um, it teaches me that students are capable sometimes of a lot more than we might think they are when we give them the freedom to learn in a way that makes sense to them. So I've really been inspired by what our students have been putting together. What ways can our audience cut down on energy consumption? So a lot of times the little things don't seem to matter, but when we're talking about saving energy, little things can make a big difference, a big impact. And so little tiny things that don't even involve a lot of cost, mostly behavioral activities, are things that can make a huge difference. Something like when you leave a room, turning off the lights or turning off your monitor, shutting down your computer. I have to tell my husband all the time, turn off your gaming system because he leaves it on so that it saves its position. But all that time, it's just using and drawing energy. So things like that, little tiny baby activities that don't seem like a big, they would make a big difference, add up over the whole course of the day, over the course of the week, and over the course of the month to make a big change on your bill. Not only do they save you money, but they save us all energy. Because if we save a little bit of energy individually, it all adds up to being a lot more energy sources that we don't have to use in the long run. Also, a powered fan is a good idea, even at night. Solar power is a great idea, but just like you mentioned, not at night. So the hard part with solar energy powered devices is you can use them as long as the sun is out. Today in Philadelphia, we're not having the sunniest day, are we guys? Not at all. No, so today, today wouldn't be a good day for solar powered devices. The only way that we can use solar powered devices when it's not sunny is if we have a battery hooked up to them that stores the energy that we haven't used for times when it might be rainy. So solar powered 
materials can be great for us. We just have to sometimes build in things like batteries and other storage methods to help make them useful all the time. What can you what can you tell skeptics about alternative energy? So the biggest thing, this is a great question. The biggest thing that sometimes people people don't like change, do they? It's hard to change your, your lifestyle. It's hard to change your activities. But the biggest thing I say is that everything has its pros and cons. Even the things that we've been using for many, many years and seem to work well have their negatives with them. And new forms of energy and new technologies will have their pros but also have their cons. So it's important to look at things and really weigh the benefits of all of them and look at the things together and how they can benefit each other. Maybe we don't have to switch entirely to one source of energy over the other, but maybe we can have them work together um, as a way to make it easier for us. The areas of science, technology, engineering, art, and math are male dominant fields. Did that discourage you in any way in pursuing your career? That's a really good question. Um, I think when I mentioned my one of my favorite scientists when I was a kid, I definitely could see that. When I was growing up, and even still today, a lot of the times you see the people who win the awards, it's all guys, it's all dudes, it's a lot of times all white dudes. And that was definitely discouraging for me when I was in science and math as a kid in elementary school and middle school and even high school and college. I was surrounded by a lot of, of males in everything that I did. And so in a lot of ways, it made me more determined to continue doing what I'm doing today because I want to make sure Jada Lee and Isabella and India are able to do what they want to do going forward. And they don't have to be discouraged by what people look like in the room around them. Oh, wow. Moving forward, how do we encourage more women to persuade STEM? Ah, so this is a tricky question because there's a lot of things that we need to do. We need to make sure opportunities are available. We need to have programs like Pico Peep so students can try their hand at lots of different things. We need to make sure that when we talk about science and math, just like you all are doing today, you're interviewing two ladies. I think it's important to make sure that we have representation. We show people doing science who look lots of different ways and are women, are men, are black, are white, are Latina or Latino. And we make sure that people um, see that science is for everybody. We have some questions from our members of the podcast club. Um, earlier when you said that they weren't into what you did, what do you mean by that? my students weren't into the activities. Um, we had, I had been working, um, when I first started teaching, I was work, working with a teacher who had taught for 30 years and he had been teaching his class the same way every year. So that when I had students um, who had parents that had mis the same science teacher, they knew what activities they were going to do because their parents told them about them. And so we were trying to use those activities the same way that, you know, their parents had learned about them. And, and I thought kids need to learn in a way that makes sense for them now. And so we had to try to find new activities and a new twist on things to keep them fun and interesting. And also because we didn't want them to cheat off what their parents had done. Jada Lee. Mm -hmm. Have you ever come across anybody who told you you couldn't do something because you were a girl and you didn't give up? Yeah, actually, I uh, in college, when I was thinking I was going to be a geoscientist all the time and study rocks, I did an internship um, with a, a quarry mining company, so a company that digs up rocks and turns them into concrete. Um, like you might see on the sidewalk and asphalt for pavement and I was oftentimes the only girl anywhere and I was working with an older man to teach him how to make the concrete stronger and I often got discouraging messages from him 
uh, about what this industry looked like and who I would be working with and how people would talk to me, how men would talk to me. And I decided that I wasn't going to take no for an answer and that I was going to keep my head down and work hard and show them that I could I could do it. And I didn't care what they thought about how I looked or that I was a woman and that I was going to to keep doing what I was able to do and I was just as capable as they were and younger and newer to it, but I was still able to make make a difference and make positive change for the company. Is Women's History Month important to you? If so, how? Can you repeat the question? Is Women's History Month important to you? If so, how? I think History Months of all kinds are important because it reminds us to, to look to the past for inspiration for the future. And so Women's History Month is really important for me because I think it helps remind us of all of the famous women that have sort of paved the way for folks like me to do interesting things going forward. So I love Women's History Month and I like celebrating the history of, of lots of different uh, months. We had Black History Month and we'll have some future um, events to celebrate going forward as well. So I particularly love Women's History Month for obvious reasons. <laughs> okay, well about our time for this episode. Can you tell our audience what they for the NEED project and your whack? Sure. Great question. So you can go to www.need.org and you can also follow us, uh, look for the NEED project at Instagram and on Twitter and also on Facebook and even on Pinterest. Thank you for being our guest today. We appreciate it. Come back anytime. Oh, you bet. You guys were lots of fun and you did great today. It was a fun interview. Well, that's been all the Offit Tower Tail podcast today. See y'all on another planet. That concludes our episode of the Moffat Tower Tale. Be sure to follow us at John Moffat Elementary. And visit our site at philosd.org, Moffat, to find out when the next episode of Moffat Tower Tale goes up. Bye bye, Moffat Tower Tale listeners. See y'all on the next episode. Well, the name of our school, John Moffat. And every day we're proud to say the name of our school, John Moffat. We always try to do our best for Moffat School Tops, all the rest. We're very